the name of Jesus just for 10 seconds and I'll start you off. So on the third one, I want everyone to join in with all that you have, all that you've got in your lungs. Are you ready? I'm going to do two and on the third one you're going to join. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If you didn't know already, my name is Dan. Um, probably. My name is Dan. I've got my beautiful wife, Abby, who's there. We've been at Castlegate Church for what? I don't know, like four, five months. And no matter the man, I, I turned up at this place. Goodness me. Goodness me. You've chiseled me. You've stomped on me. And the word of God and the hand of God has beat my life. And he's made me sharper and sharper and more and ashamed and more and ashamed and more and ashamed. That's the power of God. Now, my wife said to me one thing this morning. She goes, Dan, you're sharing. Keep it PG. There are kids in the house and there are people out on the streets who can hear me under the sound of my voice. This message I'm about to share is for you. You, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And he is calling you now. For anyone who can hear me, who has not specifically come to this church service, this is my story of what I have been through and what God has done in my life and what God can also do in yours. Yeah. Hallelujah. So, church and surrounding Dudley, I was born into this world. And the Lord had said to my mum, you're to call him Daniel. And my father did everything he could to fight against that. No, my son will not be called Daniel. But the Lord went back to my mum, Kathy, and said, you are to call him Daniel. For the Lord knew that I was going to have to go through the lion's den. For the Lord knew that he was going to be on my life. For the Lord knew that he is the God Almighty. Amen. For Daniel means God is my judge. But E-L in the end is where the Hebrews put Elohim. So the God is my judge. The God Almighty. Praise Jesus. As I was born into this world, a lot of sicknesses were struck on me. I was actually uh, born without the outer layer of my intestines. So growing up was very difficult. I had no control over my bladder. No control over my bottom and both subjects would happen at any given point until when I was in my teenage years and the Lord poured over me his grace and his healing power. But we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. I was severely, and I mean severely, dead as a child. I was in and out of hospitals, had sicknesses and diseases. I have a file at home which is about this tall off the ground. And one day I walked into my house and I saw my mother-in-law, Abby's mother, and she was, I was at work and she'd been reading and she was crying. She goes, I can't believe what you've had to go through. I'm like, yeah. it happened, get on with life. But I was known as the blue baby. I was known as the blue baby. Not because blue suited me, but because I stopped breathing. And I nearly died countless times growing up. But here's the thing, church. God started to heal me as a young boy in the church very early on. I'd see miracles, signs and wonders. I'd see my mum fall over the chairs like, Mum, are you okay? She goes, I'm with Jesus, Daniel. What about your leg? She was all good. The Lord had her. I grew up seeing God. I did. I can't deny that. I grew up seeing a relationship with a father and I counted the power of God very early on in my life. But I'm just going to fast forward a few years to primary school where I meet two men, one named Matt. Hopefully, Matt, you'll be hearing this one day. Hello, mate. Love you. He doesn't know Jesus, so we can all pray for Matt Doust. 
I hope some of my old friends are seeing this. This is for you. Matt and Harry. And at the age of primary school, I was going in and out of school, weeing and pooing whenever my body felt like it. So I was severely bullied, traumatically bullied. I was very, and do you know what's funny about it? Even the teachers were bullying me because it was just the thing to do, wasn't it? To pick on people, to point at someone and say, there's something different about you. You're different to me, so I'm going to laugh at you. And it's created a very quiet, very timid very upset child. And that actually continued when I ended up having a relationship with an older man. And this is the PG part of it. You know, things happened. I had to get over it. I thought I was just damaged and broken. I thought I was just trash laid on the side of the street. God, at this point in my life, you don't really mean much to me because where's your protection been? Where are you in this? I fast forward a few years, I'm now in secondary school and again I'm still being bullied. But do you know what happened one faithful day? I was at a kids conference in Nottingham, in Nottingham Forest stands and someone said there's healing to be done. Pray for the sick. I put my hand up and I felt God grab a kettle of water and tip it over me and from the top of my head all the way down, down of my feet, I felt the power of God like warmth heat, like getting a Costa and throwing it in your face. That's what I felt. But did it hurt me? No. And do you know what? From that moment on, I knew I was cleansed. I knew I was healed. And what I didn't realise was out of all this pain and trauma, I was on a lot of meds. I was actually on class A drugs for seven years because they didn't know what to do with me. And in this moment as well, God dealt with my intestines. He dealt with my ADHD and the class A drugs and the addiction to the class A drugs. And he also dealt with everything else that was going on in me. And literally in one moment, disease was falling off me. Disease was falling off me. And do you know why disease can fall off me in prayer? Because prayer works. And this story, hang on, hang on a minute. Okay, go on, let's give him a roar. He's worth it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd love to say I gave my life to Christ again there like I did 50 times growing up and I walked straight and now I went to church. No, because at the age of 15, the day before my first GCSE, I was due to go to London, to go to the London Tennis Academy as a young prodigy in tennis. I was sponsored. I was going to have a career. I was going to be successful traveling the world playing tennis. But the day before my first GCSE when I was 15, Harry, one of my best friends, he was out in a friend's car, car slid off the road, hit an oak tree. Harry was able to be brought out of the car. And on the helicopter to London to go and rescue him, Harry died. Harry breathed his last. And the saddest part about it for me now is Harry didn't know Jesus. Harry did not know how wonderful, how glorious, how magnificent Jesus is. And that's born on me to be a better witness today, to be a better witness tomorrow and the next day and the next day and not to hold back in uncomfortable conversations. Now, I woke up the next morning with a dead best friend. I would cried most of the night in the bathtub because I didn't know what else to do. Felt like a scene from EastEnders. <laughs> I ruined every GCSE, actually got fudge at the end of it. You could, you know, didn't really do much for you. Went to college in London, had 13% attendance for the first term, and I turned to drugs and alcohol. I turned to rolling with the gangs because there was a bit of acceptance there, and I didn't really know what acceptance was. I put my hand through my school window, this one here, and had to have plastic surgery to put my hand back together. Lost 15% of the strength in this hand. Lost my tennis career. So the drugs and alcohol became a coping mechanism for even more at this point. The women became a coping mechanism. Because what else am I meant to do? I was rolling with people who were not very nice people. In fact, just to make it really clear to you, not, not as a boastful thing of how dangerous the stuff I used to do, but my old photo 
of Facebook used to be two double barrel shotguns on my shoulder. And this kind of shows you what Jesus has done in my life. I used to roll with two double barrel shotguns. One of my friends had to flee to Spain in a 15 million pound heist. Came back from Spain, beat up a drug dealer, took his Subaru, blue Scooby WRX, his, his, his cocaine, his weed and the, the wad. And one night I was sat in the car with him saying, Chris, where have you been, mate? He's like, Dan, I need to tell you something. And I'm like, Chris, no, seriously, where have you been? No one's seen you for six months. And he tells me the story and I start counting the years I'm going to get in prison for spending time with this guy. And I get lower and lower and lower and lower because I'm the one who's cut myself off from God. Like many of you here today, Dudley, you have removed yourself from God and his law. If we go to Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament, there are 10 laws God asked us to live by. Don't lie, don't steal, don't have any other gods. Don't covet another man's wife. Don't use my name as a swear word so you can drag my son through the streets saying Jesus Christ when you feel like it. And this is exactly where I was. I had no relationship with God. I knew God. I could hear God speak to me so clearly. But for some reason, I kept getting lower and lower to the point where I started staying up endless days on drugs. Copious amounts of class A drugs. Five nights in a row was my worst. Where I'd just been up, just doing stuff. Breaking the law, criminal, running drugs between London and the South. Beating people up in the dark corners of the streets. Dragging men out of pubs and actually dra- talking to dragging men out of the pubs. One day I did that. For no reason, I actually had a game of pool with a bloke. And the man was a gypsy and where I'm from, you do not do that. Actually, they're the police. You're asking for a death wish and I kind of was at this point. I grabbed the man who had just played Paul without the pub, dragged him out of the pub and started hitting him in the streets. And this is the first crime I ever did where I did it in front of people, where you could see it with your own eyes, where CCTV had view of me. Next day, the police came to my house, picked me up on you straight away. Didn't, I didn't argue, didn't run away, just said to them, I'm not putting cuffs on, you're not going to cuff me, but I'll walk and I'll get in the back of that car. And so I did. I got in that car. Again, I'm back in the cell like I've done many times. This time I know I'm done for it because the cops have been trying to get hold of me for years, really, to be quite honest with you. There's a lot of stuff they wanted to talk to me about and the association of my friends, shall we say. I'm going to fast forward a few months. The court case is going on, Brighton Crown Court. I know I've pleaded guilty and I think there's no way out of this. So this one night, me and my friends decide to go into an adventure play park, a bit like a Go Ape. Has anyone here been to Go Ape? Yeah? A couple of people have been to Go Ape. Wonderful. Brilliant. That helps. So up in the the trees, we're swinging one night on drugs. I drunk a little bottle of vodka, but it's doing nothing because I had the rest of the class A's going on. And we got this abseiling tower. And we got to take some photos, being idiots. And I hear a voice speak to me like I'm speaking to you now. And he said, do you think you could push yourself off the edge and climb down the rock wall? And I was like, oh, that's it, why not? And I did. My friends started going down the stairs. One of the friends was Matt, the other best friend. And I pushed myself off this edge about 35 feet in the air, went down a few feet, and I heard the same voice say to me, are you not fed up of life? Do you want to really be here anymore? Like, surely, what's the point? Your dad hates you. You've got a broken relationship with your family. You're on your way to prison. You're a drug addict, woman abuser, alcoholic, dealing, guns, knives, bats by the side of my bed, always looking over my shoulder. And do you know what? I agreed with him. I said, do you know what? I really actually, for the first time in my life, I don't really want to be here. And he said, well, why don't you kick your feet off? So I did. I kicked my feet off. I'm now... 30 odd feet in the air, holding on to the grips of the rock wall with my hands. And he said, let go. And I said, I'm ready, I'm ready to die. I said to myself in that moment, I said, I'm ready to die. This is it. So I let go and I fell about 30 odd feet, we reckon. And I hit very, very hard ground. 
And as I hit the ground, I knew I was dead. I was very aware that I was dead. And I had this huge level of fear come over my life. And it was shame. I was filled with shame. How dare I kill myself and end my life? How dare I? What a coward's way out of this world. But I did it in a way that there's no way I'm coming back. But someone else had other plans. Someone else had other plans. I want to tell you, church, this wasn't the first time I tried it in my life. I continue to do it after this moment. But what I said to God when I was dead in that moment, I said, God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, God, if I'm still alive after this, I'll live for you for the rest of my life. And I felt someone breathe on me. That was a bit weird. Well, I went, <gasps> opened my eyes and I had my friends in front of me and they picked me up to my feet and they were like, you're dead and now you're up. And I'm looking at my knees wondering why they're not where my shoulders are. How, what's, what's wrong? What, what? And I'm looking at my hands going, I'm okay. And my mate Matt goes, I thought I just lost my second best friend. Start smacking me in the chest, going, you idiot, you idiot. And then we realised there was nothing wrong with me. I went to Guildford Hospital the next day, had an x-ray after four hours of arguing with the doctors and the nurses. And he came up to me, and Mr Hawkins slapped the x-rays on me and said, you must be a liar or your God must be real because there's not a hairline fracture on your body. Do you know what's funny? My body was better than it was before. I fast forward a few months, you know, I've met Abby. Abby's in my life. Oh, no, 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 no. Abby just wanted a dealer so she could get free stuff. Let's say it how it is. No, actually, funny, funny, no, I actually saw Abby at a party and I, and I, and I knew I'd met my wife. I'd never thought that before. And Abby says the exact same. She goes, I knew I met my husband. We both knew in that moment and we stuck together ever since through the thick and thin. So Abby, I honour you. I love you. I cherish you. Yeah, come on. Thank you, darling. Thank you so much. I love you. I appreciate you. I'm there, Brighton Crown Court. I think I was the age of about 22 at this point. This is my sentencing day. And I'm outside the courtroom. Got the big wooden doors to my right. And the, uh, I get a call from a barrister and he says, I can't make it. I've called, I've called the office. They've, uh, they've got someone coming. I'm like, what do you mean you're not coming? This is my sentencing. This is the day I actually need you. Where are you? Anyway, about 15 minutes later, long story short, this man walks up to me. And an ecliptic clock with his nice shiny shoes walking down the corridor. And he stands in front of me. I'm looking at the floor thinking, what an idiot. How on earth did I end up here? I went to Sunday school. <laughs> well, how, how did this happen? I had friends in and out stabbing people in prison, doing all sorts of things to survive in prison because of our associates, shall we say. And this man says to me, goes to me, hello, Daniel. And I look at his shiny shoes, which are right in between where I'm sat. And I said to him, how do you know my name? Now, I know some of you have heard this, so calm down. <laughs> he, he says, look at me. And I looked at him and he goes, I know you because I've been praying for you your whole life. And I said to him, I said, what? You've been praying for me my whole life? He goes, I'm your barrister. I got a call from the office. My name is Guy. I've come to represent you today. And it just so happens that I go to your mother's church. And every time you tried to kill yourself, every time you've been in a prison cell, every time you've died on the streets, which I've had multiple times in fights, God would wake your mother up. And he said, Kathy, now's the time to pray for Daniel. Otherwise, he's going to die. He gave my mum the choice in prayer. And my mum would get on the phone. She'd start ringing all these people, a small group of people at church, faithful Christians. So when they pray, things happen in other people's lives. He says to me, I've been praying for you your whole life. And now I want to pray with you. And I said, mister, I don't know how to pray. He goes, don't you worry, I'll pray for you. He grabbed my hands and he said, Lord, forgive him. Lord, have mercy on him. Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but don't let him go to prison, Lord. You've got a calling on this boy's life. And I cried and I cried and I stopped crying. I said, right, okay, I'm going in the courtroom. And I had a peace that the Bible says that goes beyond all human understanding. I went into that room. 
I stood there, I watched the judge hit his hammer, and for some unknown reason, other than the kingdom of God, he said, suspended prison sentence and everything else he could throw at me. This meant I wasn't going. I walked out the courtroom, courtroom, the pats were going, shh. I had my face in the media. I looked like an idiot because everyone knew at this point. And Abby said to me, Dan, if you do not come back to God and give your life to God, I'm going to walk away from you. But I don't want to because I believe you're my husband, so I need you to get right. And I went home and got rid of all the cannabis parts, all the drugs, all the, all the, the weapons, went to church, gave my life to Jesus, cried my eyes out and said, Lord, forget it. I don't trust myself anymore, so I'm going to trust you. A few years later on, I'm there getting baptised and let's be fair, the guys at the church who had baptised me wanted to make sure that I was never going to come back to life because who knows on the day of your baptism, as the Lord says, be born again. There was also a funeral for me happening that very same day. Dan was dying. And as as Paul said, it's not I who lives, it's Christ who lives in me. That's what was happening. And they grabbed me and they threw me into that water in that pool so hard. That this small wave went up, caught on the cameras, and splashed everyone, splashed the cameras, and they wanted to make sure that it really worked this time. I was walking down the road, still smoking, still doing stuff, still carrying on with my sinful life, but things were starting to change. And I was rolling a spicy cigarette, and I heard the audible voice of God say to me, Dan, I need you to go to Birmingham, there's going to be a, a revival. And I was like, what? That was weird. Went to lick it. Went to lick it. And I heard him say it again. Dan, there's going to be a revival in Birmingham. Will you go? Now, bearing in mind, calm down. I don't know if that's in my lifetime or the next, but I'm certainly going to carry on throwing seeds until I see that happen. Okay? Amen? Amen. 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 Got some long-term seed sowers in here with some big bags on your back. Brilliant. I happened to move to Birmingham a few months later on thinking, I'm never going to move to Birmingham. That's never going to happen. And so I did. I had to leave a lot of friendships behind who were like, Dan, hang on a minute, you know too much. Hang on a minute, Dan, it's, you can't be a good person because if you're a good person, you might say something to someone one day and that will land me with a life, life sentence. So what I did one night with Abby is we packed up a van and we left. I never saw any of those people again. I completely detached myself in one go from my past, from my pain and my hurt that I'd already said, Jesus, have it all. And here I am a few years later on after moving around Birmingham a few times. Gosh, Abby, I'm so sorry for moving you around. But look where we landed. Look at this family. Look at what happens in this church. Oh my gosh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. But I'll say this to you, church. To Dudley, who are listening, I lived in Birmingham. I was a leader in a church, terrified and scared because the fear of man had never been broken off me. I was terrified to talk, say boo to ghosts. But do you know what? The Lord knew that that was going to be a problem in my life. So he sent a Jason Smith. And who knows that there's no way that's going to stay on your life if you're friends with Jay. Last year in April, Jay had been in Ukraine as the war was kicking off. And I thought, what a nutter. What a plonker. He'd come back and he actually said, Dan, I'm going to go back and I want you to come with me. And I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm too busy doing business. I'm too busy making passive income here, passive income there, having a flash house, having a big fast car. And the Lord said to me, no, Dan, you are actually going to go to Ukraine. I was like, oh, okay. So I flew off to a war zone. And Jay was preaching at the Ukrainian border with Poland as six million people were coming through it. Many people without passports. Many people who were dropping off their, their wives and their children who were accountants and plumbers, electricians, and going back to pick up a gun. It was devastating. But my goodness me, was the glory of God there. Thousands and thousands of people making decisions every week. Lives being changed and tra- challenged and transformed from religion to relationship. And I'm there and I say, God, deal with me. I don't want to feel like this anymore. And the power of God came on me like I put my hand on a 240 volt cable and he electrocuted me. And he said, you will no longer be fearful. And at that moment in my life, church, I was never to be scared or fearful ever again. 
this was the point where my life changed and a few months later on I'm in Germany traveling with Jay now getting on flights with Jay watching Jesus work miracle signs and wonders through Jason Smith I know he turns up and he looks like an average guy who's sponsored by Blakely <laughs> but actually this man is a phenomenal 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 follower of Jesus Christ and Jay I want to honour you as we all do for everything you do, for what you pour out, and everything that you give to other people. Thank you. And Lorraine, thank you for always being there for him. I've seen things, church. The only thing I'm left waiting to see is someone raised from the dead. Everything else has happened because Jesus said it would. And I'm here because God prophesied over my life last year through Pastor Craig spoke so clearly to me and then said it 12 times to me because I was ignoring him which led me and Abby to move in house to move in here to be with you and to see what God is going to do now I want to say this to you when you die to yourself over and over and over and over again Jesus builds you and builds you and builds you again give everything to him there's some lukewarm Christianity in the room. Give it to Jesus. There are people who are stuck in pornography. Yes, I'm talking to you. Give it to Jesus. There are people here with sicknesses and diseases thinking that will never be me. Give up all that you have to Jesus and watch him wash you as white as snow. He'll cleanse your life and he'll take you on adventures and dreams that you could never even imagine. Church, I want to thank you for listening so intently. I want to thank you. I want to give God the glory. Thank you for all that you're doing in my life and the many of my brothers and sisters and those who are yet to give their lives to Christ. This is for you. You know full well if you were to die today, you do not have peace with God. Peace comes when you know the Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Today, there will be a call. I'm sure about it after knowing who's preaching after this. And you will give an opportunity to change your life. Run it in. I want to see people running to the altar today. Give your life to Jesus today. God bless you. Take care.